there is no reason that we shouldn't have a country of origin labeling on our finished doses and our active ingredients. I mean, the shirt you're wearing right now is going to tell you where it was made, right? So, so that's got to change. But <laughs>I'm here with Catherine Eban. Great to be with you here and great to see you again. Thanks for having me, Marty. It's nice to be here. Catherine is one of our preeminent investigative journalists um, and has done some incredible work. If you've seen the movie The Report, it was in part inspired on her Vanity Fair article. And she has done incredible work in the uh, generic drug sourcing world. Her new book, uh, The Bottle of Lies, is a New York Times bestseller. She actually is a former New York Times investigative reporter, writes now for Fortune. And um, gosh, if we had more investigative journalism in healthcare, it would have a tremendous impact on the field. I mean, I hate to think of uh, today's world without the investigative journalists we do have who have exposed so much wrongdoing. Uh, but of course, there's always more work to do. So. Thank God for the ones we do have, and we need more, I'd for sure. I'd love to send our surgical residents for their research years when they spend two years in the lab to spend two years doing investigative journalism mentored by you. Love it. I mean, this, this, some of the stuff that you've uncovered um, is just incredible. Um, now, you were a Rhodes Scholar. You went to Brown. Yep. Not too shabby. Rhodes Scholar, Oxford. Um, Everyone who has a Rhodes Scholarship is required in the scholarship to have some sport and do some athletic uh, piece to their scholarship. Uh, um, not many people know that. What was your sport? I was in the circus. <laughs> That's a sport. And I was a clown. Okay. Some people say I still am one, but yes. In the I, drug industry, we're uh, doing research <laughs> now. You're still working uh, in a circus. I was a clown, and according to the selection committee, I was the first clown that they ever selected. <laughs> Tell me about, I'm just blown away by this book. Thank you. Um, what tipped you off to get into this space of understanding where the medications we physicians prescribe come from and their safety? You know, most big investigations, at least the ones that I've worked on, always begin with some kind of tip or phone call. And that phone call for me came in 2008. Um, I was contacted by Joe Graydon, who is a host of um, the People's, People's Pharmacy. Pharmacy. Yeah. The podcast. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, you know, he is a trained pharmacologist. And he said his show was being flooded with complaints by listeners, patients who had taken generic drugs uh, and had relapses when they were switched or suffered side effects. Um, he had taken their complaints to the FDA and officials there basically were dismissive, you know, that this was uh, psychosomatic, the color of the pills or the shape was different, but he did not believe that. And so then he... So the FDA basically said, these people are just kind of crazy. Yeah. There's nothing there. Yeah. This is the normal variation of complaints right. that we get. Yeah. And he didn't take that for an answer. That's right. And, you know, the FDA, and we can come back to this later because I have a theory about it, but the FDA said, especially when a pill first goes generic. So you have all these people switching from brand to generic, and that's when they complain the most. Um, and I actually have a theory about why that is, new which production, we could talk about. New production. So. Well, I actually think that the generic drug companies may, in fact, not know how to make the drug when they first launch it because they haven't tested it properly. They get their approval, their first to file, then they go back into the lab and figure out how to actually make it. The, the big take home yeah. I took from this book most of the generic drugs that we physicians prescribe come from overseas. Right. Hasn't always been like that, but that's the way we have it now. And that what's happening overseas is mind boggling. Yeah. It's, I mean, it is really uh, the jungle for the 21st century. And I say that referring to the Upton Sinclair uh, expose of the jungle where he exposed what was happening in, you know, the U.S. meatpacking plants. But what you have is, you know, countries making our life-saving drugs where they do not have um, 
a years long, decades long regulatory system up and running. And so it is really just a free for all. It is just a wild scene in a lot of these um, overseas plants. One patient found a bug in, in New Jersey. A patient sent her medication, I think it was an antihypertensive medication, mm -hmm. found a live bug yeah. in the pill in New Jersey, yeah. sent by Express Scripts, one yeah. of the biggest PBMs. You spent 10 years doing the research for this book, spent time in China and India. Right. What did you see over there? Um, you know, first of all, the, when I went into these manufacturing plants, my visits were mostly dog and pony shows to show me pristine plants. They knew you were coming. They knew I was coming. They had let me come in. But I saw a very different world within these plants through whistleblowers. I worked with a lot of whistleblowers who had contacted me or I had made contact with them who were showing me documents, showing me photographs, um, you know, giving me really these sort of gory details of what was happening in these plants and the kinds of crazy decisions that were being made like, um, you know, failing drugs, drugs that had glass particles in them were being approved to be dispensed. Um, broken down, rusted equipment that was leaving metallic fragments in pills. Those were being dispensed. Um, uh, you know, illicit, um, illicit use of ingredients. So you can't just swap ingredients, but they had drugs that were dissolving improperly. So they just haphazardly changed things up to try to get better data to show the FDA. So all of this was taking place in a kind of lawless regulatory environment. They're not afraid of their own regulators, so they're afraid of the FDA, but what they have built is an elaborate system to trick the FDA. And our FDA has all but volunteered to be tricked because we announce our inspections in advance overseas. We give three months notice. They send in data fabrication teams so there's no surprise visits? There's no surprise visits. Was there in the past? You know, there was a pilot program that my book exposed, and I'll tell you, Congress is very interested in this pilot program because they decided, limited program, we're going to do all the visits uh, in India unannounced or short notice. They did it for a year and a half, and boy, once they were walking into these plants on short notice, they were finding unbelievable stuff. Like, like what? sterile manufacturing plants that are just inventing their microbial testing data. You know, they're supposed to test the fabricating. air. Fabricating. Fabricating. You know, uh, insp FDA inspectors walked into one plant and the, the microbial testing data was perfect. It was all looked great. You know, the air, the water, the surfaces, all good. They weren't testing anything. They just invented this data. You describe lizards, snakes, yeah. dirty floors, yeah. mops used for the bathrooms used in the drug manufacturing facility. Is this sort of an egregious thing of the past or is this an ongoing issue right now? This is absolutely ongoing. I mean, there is, there is no change. And, you know, India's plants have gotten a lot of warning letters from the FDA. The Indian industry is saying, oh, this is totally in the past. It had to do with this one company, Rambaxi. There is no evidence to support that whatsoever. I mean, this is an ongoing issue. Nothing has changed. Since my book came out, Congress is probing this. Um, you know, I got to say, looking at what's going on in Washington, my hopes are uh, a little diminished for real change, but that's what we need. Because of the influence of the special interests? Well, general inaction in government. Yeah. I mean, we're in an anti regulatory era. And these, uh, our regulatory infrastructure is essentially being dismantled around us. The thing is, if anybody was in these plants, there is nobody who's going to want to take medicine from a sterile manufacturing facility where there is no drainage piping in the bathroom right next to. A production area. These horrific conditions you're describing, are the, these plants still producing medications 
that we U.S. physicians are prescribing because we don't know the source. Let's be honest. Yeah. When I write a script. Yeah. We don't. I have no idea how, where that medication right. is made, right, and what the plant conditions are. Well, you know, let me just first say you don't know where the medication is made because the companies deem it to be proprietary, and that has got to change. There is no reason that we shouldn't have a country of origin labeling on our finished doses and our active ingredients. I mean, the shirt you're wearing right now is going to tell you where it was made, right? So, so that's got to change. But, <laughs> but you're right. You, you can't know. And you should be able to know. The surprise visit yeah. <clears throat> thing. Yeah. That that seems like a... And I'm glad Congress is acting on your book since it hit the New York Times list. Yeah. Um, th- that gives inspires me a little bit. Um, <laughs> um, but this, this simple fix that you're offering of let's switch to surprise visits right. seems so logical. And I'll tell you my little experience. When the Joint Commission comes to a hospital and they used to do surprise visits, they were getting an interesting cross-section of what's actually taking place. When they started to announce their visit, Mm -hmm. hospitals began to put literally a banner over their front door saying, please welcome the Joint Commission. They would send it. I received text pages. Please welcome the Joint Commission uh, visiting with us today. And of course, everyone's on their best behavior. So you kind of lose that ability to assess what's right. really happening. Seems like a, one simple solution. Now imagine if the Joint Commission called up the hospital and said, um, could you make our hotel reservations for us and send um, a vehicle to pick up our inspectors at the airport? Because that's what's happening overseas with these FDA inspections. It's nuts, right? The FDA is actually asking the um, the local manufacturing plants to serve as travel agents. <laughs> so the the plant being inspected yeah. by the the FDA yeah. by the United States FDA is making the hotel and travel and car service car arrange- lux- luxury vehicles. They're sending luxury sure. vehicles to the airport. Why not splurge? They're they're, up- <laughs> they're upgrading FDA inspectors' hotel rooms. They never see a bill. Then they're arranging, you know, trips to the Taj Mahal, massages, uh, offers of gold coins. It's nuts. This is, so, uh, separate from the massages. Yeah. Uh, we, maybe we can include <laughs> There's massages. a lot of massages. It, is that right? Yes. Interesting. And, in yeah. general, in those countries or among the in- oh, offered no. to the inspectors? Offered to the FDA inspector. Interesting. Yes. Is this legal or illegal under U.S. law? Is any part of it legal? Right. That's a really good question. So so the FDA investigators who are going overseas, they don't get any special training for this, right? What they get is the usual ethics training. You're not allowed to accept a gift that's over $20. But it all gets very murky. I mean, you're being offered a, a closing night banquet. So what do you do with this banquet? Do you take out your credit card? Uh, do you offer cash? I mean, how do you end up uh, making sure you're not accepting anything more than $20? How do you not offend the people who had you there? Um, Lipitor is one of those medications that you identify was made, <clears throat> probably is currently being made with substandard conditions, mm-hmm. according to what you write about. The company that raced to make the generic yeah. form. And there is a bit of an arms race now to move to generic because right. of drug pricing. And you basically describe how these um, officials of the generic company yeah. rushed the FDA. There was like a fist fight in the parking lot of the FDA. They, this is really, when I started hearing about these fist fights in the FDA parking lot, I was just blown away, but it made perfect sense. So there was this incentive that was built into the generic drug approval process, which is called first to file. Basically what that says is, if you're the first generic company, first being first by seconds, uh, to put down your application at the FDA, and you're approved to make the drug, you get six months of exclusivity on the market. So, you know, to give you a sense of how much that exclusivity is worth. A lot of money. 
it was $600 million for Ranbaxy when it made generic Lipitor, okay? So these companies were going in, I started hearing about the companies, they're sending their reps in to the FDA parking lot in stretch limos where they're taking turns waiting and sleeping. They're online, right? They're pitching tents in the FDA parking lot. Um, then they're lining up right at the door, and then the question is, when the door opens in the morning, who's going to be first? I heard about this altercation where um, a Rambaxi, I think, was it a Mylan rep pushed a Rambaxi? Mylan Pharmaceuticals? Yes. Well known to the public? Yes. Pulled, uh, pushed a Rambaxi rep out of the line so that she was in first through the door. I mean, a literal altercation, you know. So, of course, you hear these stories as an investigative journalist. you got to prove it. And there was this memo that the FDA put out, this guidance, which basically said, you know, we are very concerned about these tents that are being pitched in the FDA parking lot <laughs> this for, is like for in, weeks. Uh, in Silver Spring, Maryland. Yeah. yeah. I'm like, you can't, you can't make this stuff up. I mean, there's the memo. You know, there's the guidance from FDA saying we're, you know, we're concerned about, you know, safety uh, in, in the parking lot, et cetera. Have you talked to Stephen Hahn, the new FDA commissioner, about any of these issues? I have not, and I have to say that the uh, FDA was not too chatty with me when I came to them with a whole array of questions. I mean, they did respond, they did send statements, but they did not make anybody available for me to talk to when I was closing the book. If I make an introduction with you and Stephen Hahn, would you be interested in talking to him? Oh, I'd love to talk to him, absolutely. What do you think he would say? I mean, the reason I am asking is that Oftentimes, the FDA, and the commissioner in particular, mm -hmm. is the subject of a pile-on mm -hmm. of blame for problems right. that stem really from congressional funding because the Congress, many of whom are getting paid right. by a special interest, don't want surprise inspections of right. plants that produce the majority of generic right. drugs. They will ensure that that funding stream is not there and that mm -hmm. this division, despite the best intentions of those leading the FDA, is not funded. And so we hear lots of stories about deals and threats and quid pro quos. And of course, this is almost the business of government yeah. sometimes. Yeah. And so I wonder what he would say to this. You know, he's a cancer yeah. doctor from yeah. um, MD yeah. Anderson. Yeah. Good guy. Yeah. I mean, I don't know what he would say, but if he was going to kind of be in line with the talking points of the agency, you know, what he would say is, we have a risk-based system. I mean, nobody ever really spells out exactly what the system is, but where we make these careful evaluations, we will do surprise inspections if need be, and Americans can be confident that their generic drugs are safe. I mean, it's, you know, that's what they say. That's what they've told Congress. Uh, and then, of course, any example to the contrary is like, well, you know. Have there been, has there been any evidence of surprise visits since your book came out? Uh, I have heard rumblings that they may be starting another pilot program, okay. but they have not changed the policy. Okay. You know, Janet Woodcock did testify before Congress, would it be better to do more inspections, to do surprise inspections? Yes. Uh, but it does seem like a sort of... Well, I don't understand what, the, what there is to discuss. Right. We could have hearings. You right. could, we could write 15 articles in the medical literature, <laughs> which is what we tend to do in right. healthcare. Right. I mean, th this is so aggravating because this is, this is not... You know, we hear about sort of the one-offs and the fraud in, in healthcare. We learned about the generic drug companies colluding on price in right. the 60 Minutes piece. Right. But this is the majority of yeah. medications that are generic that we U.S. physicians prescribe. Right. What can doctors do about this? If they're as angry as I am right now, yeah. um, are there any success stories? Are there hospitals that have done anything? Like the Cleveland yes. Clinic story yes. you mentioned. Yeah. The, so there are success stories. Now, let me just say, I mean, I have infinite respect for physicians and I recognize how sort of overworked and beleaguered they are often. Thank you. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So for me to sit here and sort of give them an assignment of something more they have to consider seems crazy. But I will tell you the story of... But, but if we're pissed yes, off and yeah, we want to do yeah, something, yeah, what can okay. we do? So I think, you know, first of all, on a, on a patient level, I mean, since my book came out and I have presented to audiences of physicians, and I've had some physicians say to me, interestingly, wow, you know, I thought that when my patients complained, they were just being whiners. And now I'll think about it in a whole different way, right? And so now instead of switching to a different kind of therapy, maybe I'm going to switch to a different manufacturer. Uh, so that is what a fellow named Dr. Harry Lever at the Cleveland Clinic has done, is he became, he, he not only, he's a cardiologist, he was, and I tell his story. What's that heart? Is that what cardiology is? Yes, okay. it is, right, as just, a matter of fact. Okay. Don't worry, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> um, so, you know, in addition to diagnosing his patients, he started diagnosing the drug supply. And he basically felt that his job was to figure out which drugs by which manufacturers were working and which weren't. And through his vigilance and his recognition of recurring problems with the same manufacturers, many of them foreign, Indian, uh, he began uh, making a difference in the whole health system. So he began working with the Cleveland Clinic pharmacists who are really top flight. And they developed a blacklist of manufacturers whose drugs they no longer buy. Based on data that their problems are based on reports or suspicions? Suspicions and clinical observations. You know, and what he said to me is, we don't have data, but what he has is his years of experience and his recognition that there is no other explanation for a stabilized patient to suddenly become unstable, except that there was this medication switch. Mm. You know, so he began tracking that. So when a doctor has a funny feeling yeah. that this medication is not working as it should, yeah. or there's a prof side effect profile that yeah. doesn't seem warranted, right? they can kind of make a note and that yeah. formulary committee or PNT committee, as some right. hospitals call it, can then look for patterns. Right. And they, you're saying they've basically done this at the Cleveland Clinic where they've identified patterns right. to say, okay, we're not gonna use this supplier based in India. That's right, and they were literally finding that there were heart transplant patients who had been stabilized, were taking successful recoveries, were taking uh, tacrolimus, um, a, they were taking the brand name immunosuppressant, and they were switched to Dr. Reddy's tacrolimus, and uh, suddenly their patients were showing up uh, in the ER with symptoms of organ rejection. So then my question as an investigative journalist, well, you know, are they the only ones? Like, you know, there's not really a lot of data here. And through sources inside the FDA, I was able to dig up a report from Loma Linda um, from their transplant team saying, we are finding our patients are becoming unstable only when they're switched to the Dr. Reddy's tacrolimus. So, you know, there were, here was a corroborating set of observations from a different transplant center. I thought that was very interesting. Is there an opportunity for transparency to help? Let's say patients, when they go to, say, GoodRx, mm -hmm. can see where the medication comes from or... You know, and the problem is, I guess, you've got overseas manufacturing plants that are use sound practices and those that you've clearly exposed. Right. And it's not a one off thing. It is right. prevalent. How they do business. Most of them, some small fraction. Well, I mean, here's a little data set. Um, one of the FDA investigators I feature in the book is a guy named Peter Baker very intrepid investigator. So he would go into these plants and instead of just taking the data printout showing everything was great, he'd look in the computers. And he found all of this metadata linked to these hidden tests where they're pre-testing the drugs to try to figure how to alter the parameters of the test to get good data. So he did 86 inspections in India and China over four years and he found evidence of fraud in four-fifths of the plants he inspected. To me, that's very compelling evidence that this is really endemic. 
this is how the industry works. The FDA does not do its own testing of drugs, is that correct? Right, that is correct. They rely on the manufacturers, the pharma companies, right. to submit their quality and safety profile yeah. data. Right. An honor system, by An the honor way. System. That's what we call that, okay. yes. And ge in general, I like honor systems, but this one, I'm not sure we can trust them given the, the track record you described right. and exposed. Right. Are they being forthcoming about their data and do they keep track of the data so that if something is not safe, that is discoverable? Well, they're supposed to keep track of the data, you know, but the FDA found, in fact, they were destroying data. Um, now, you know, this sort of boils down to good manufacturing practices and general expectations. Uh, you know, but when the FDA went in, I mean, they're very reluctant to enforce to the sort of letter of the regulation uh, and, and sanction these companies that are violating these regulations. I mean, they're very reluctant to use their own authority. So you have companies that are clear transgressors uh, that have not been uh, brought to, you know, brought to justice, as it were. If a, a New Jersey U.S. company does a safety study and a drug is not safe, generally that's discoverable information, right? right? And, and thanks to the whistleblower culture in the United States, if right. there's destruction of data, that tends to get detected. I guess my question is, overseas, do these plants do secret testing? Yes. So if the tests... Yeah are not favorable, right. nobody will ever see it. Right. That's right. Because they, what they do is they'll do secret pre-testing, then they'll delete those pre-tests, and then they'll retest it with the new alteration of parameters and get a great data result. And the only way that this was discovered by Peter Baker was because he was able to see evidence of the deleted tests in the metadata. But my God, I mean, you're going to rely on him to do that. The other thing that we were relying on, I mean, the way Rambaxi got caught is through a whistleblower named Dinesh Thakur. There is no incentive to be a whistleblower uh, in India. I mean, it's basically a death sentence. It's not a back blow. Yeah, and there's no legal protection and there's no financial upside. I mean, there is no upside to being a whistleblower. Uh, he was a whistleblower because he had a conscience that wouldn't let him sleep. Uh, and that's why it got exposed. Him. But, you know, without him, without Peter Baker, I mean, there, this, our regulatory system uh, is not set up to detect criminal behavior. It is set up to encourage good behavior by companies, but it is not set up to detect criminal behavior. I think I'm seeing why generic drug companies are more successful from a business mm -hmm. standpoint outside of the United States. You can do secret testing, it's not yeah. discoverable. There's very few whistleblower um, protections. Yeah. The conditions can be substandard. There's no surprise inspections. Do you ever just say, look, I'm never gonna take a generic medication unless I know it's made in the United States or one of the countries that's known to have good production standards. Do you, does it get that extreme? Um, there are companies whose drugs I will never take because I have it in my head. I mean, I have that information in my head from my reporting that I know which companies I would like to avoid. You know, I, I never want my kids to take medication made by those companies. You know, the, the problem here is how is a consumer, what's a consumer supposed to do? I mean, and what's a doctor supposed to do? So one of the things that, you know, I've said we need consumer, big consumer organizations like the AARP, um, you know, all of these great organizations to do their own testing. I mean, where is the ranking? You know, we rank cars, we rank washing machines. Why isn't there testing and ranking of generic manufacturers? Maybe this is a business idea for you. Have you thought about talking <laughs> to some entrepreneurs and have them come up with a sort of credentialing system for 
generic medications where they would be independent testing, kind of like a, a UL brand? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I have had some of those conversations and I've had it not because I want to be an entrepreneur, which I don't. And, you know, I'm an investigative journalist. For people out there who want to yeah. early retirement, yeah. yacht, whatever the dream is, here's a business idea. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's like we need a Yelp for generic drugs. You know, what I was thinking was because there is data out there. I mean, there are, there are companies like FDA Zilla who... Um, have all of the data from FDA inspections that they capture, and it's searchable if you for companies that pay a fee for that. But why isn't there an app where consumers, when they go into the drugstore, where they can just search and they can see, hey, you know, that is the company that was busted for sterility failures and making up data. I don't really want to take their drug. Tell us about Circa. This is an exciting thing that some doctors are involved in now. Intermountain Health. Civica. Civica, Civica RX. Yeah, Civica yeah, yeah. RX, yeah. So uh, the idea of Civica RX is a nonprofit. I mean, let's just say a nonprofit drug manufacturer. Hello. That's a great idea. Why don't we have more of those? So a nonprofit drug manufacturer who um, whose sort of charter mission is to make generic drugs in short supply um, the idea was that they would um, commission, they would um, seek out a customer base that was healthcare systems, and they would, with transparency, try to make the drugs in the U.S. Um, uh, you know, and basically sort of tackle both the quality problem and the shortage problem and the cost problem. Uh, so I think it's a brilliant idea. So this way, the hospitals can use a trusted source. Right. For their medications and this is this um civica rx is a new endeavor and, yes and um this it could address some of these problems yeah i know. think it's a very i think it's a very exciting idea you know and i think the idea is that if you guarantee supply by having these health systems as your customer base right so you have a guaranteed uh demand and then you could guarantee supply um, and set up operations in the U.S. where the quality would be high uh, and it would be well inspected by the FDA, I think it sounds like a tremendous win. One final question. Mm -hmm. as Since you're an investigative reporter, one of your stories was on bees dying in the United States. Why are bees dying? Well, I personally think, and I think there's a lot of evidence to show that it's these neonicotinoids which are these class of pesticides that disorient bees and basically attack their nervous system. You know, and we have a very powerful pesticide lobby that has kept those, uh, those pesticides on the market. I think Europe banned them at some point. I'm not sure what the status is now, but I became a little bit obsessed with the bee death problem. It's really crazy and the, the bee farmers are just being devastated uh, by these uh, by these pesticides. And I also became such a admirer of bees. I mean, if I, I went to a lot of, um, I don't know what they're called, bee farms. Bee or, farms. Bee farms. I went to a lot of bee farms, and apparently a single bee, if you, even if you have a lot of different hives, they have these little boxes that are different colors, bees, if they're not like soused with neonicotinoids, can find their way back to their home. Interesting. Yeah. You know, honey is now being regarded more highly as a health food for many reasons. Uh, but I thought that was an interesting piece that you had. So Thank all of you. these articles can be found online at your website. Yeah. And Bottle of Lies is the book. It's an awesome read. Uh, Catherine, great to see you again. Thank you for having me. I enjoyed this conversation. Well, I think we need more investigative journalism in healthcare, so keep up the great work. Thank you very much. All right.